All right, so our topic is metabolism. You want lights on or off? Okay. So when you think of metabolism, what do you think about? Burning fat. Burning fat. Okay. What else? Energy. Energy. Yeah, so that's actually what metabolism is. Uh, and it is you usually think about right our food uh, metabolism is what happens to our food to become energy is usually the typical answer. Uh, it's also we're metabolizing all the time. Uh, so even when we're sleeping, so 24 seven, our cells are always working. Uh, so whether you're climbing at high altitude or you're another class, they're always watching that we're a new green class uh, or dolphin. You can be a football player jumping for dolphins. And I showed this picture before. Uh, this is a sum, probably not the total sum, but of what's going on in your cell of all the metabolic pathways. Uh, and it's hard to see because it's so small, but a lot of these arrows are two ways, or there's branches where there are choices. And so we're going to talk about it. Uh, here in the middle, this is the citric acid cycle, which we'll talk about briefly today. Uh, and anyway, it's pretty amazing to realize in each one of these steps, every arrow is a different enzyme, which is a protein. Um, and so you have lots of proteins that do different things, but it's pretty cool. Um, so there's two parts to metabolism. There is the catabolic pathways, which we're going to be talking about today. And as it shows, that's taking the large molecules of food we eat and breaking them down into smaller pieces to make energy. And anabolic pathways are the opposite. And both are going on in your cells. Uh, so if you don't actually need the energy, you're going to be storing. So anabolic is also thought of as storage. Catabolic means breaking down. So I couldn't dress this as a cat today. I totally forgot. I blew it. Um, so energy means ATP, and ATP is now a buzzword. It used to be, but um, and that just is energy for our cell, um, and that is produced when food is broken down, uh, and it's used by all different processes, not just your muscles, but everything going on your cells. Uh, transport of nutrients within your body, uh, and then time we have to synthesize. So when we're making DNA, uh, making other proteins, uh, we're going to be using a triphosphate. Uh, and if we're going the other way, an anabolic process um, for storage, we're going to actually be using ATP. So that's what it's showing. Because that's why we're always eating. So the catabolic is breaking down anabolic. So it's your first question, right? Um, and so this is a picture of ATP because I'm a biochemist. So I'm going to show a picture of molecules. And so also this is a nice reminder. If your last topic is a spice, so um, make sure, tell me what you want to do. And uh, there's going to be molecules in your spice. So don't be afraid to show a few of the molecules. But for those of you who've had some chemistry, which should be all of you, it's called PP because there's three phosphates. And it's the bond between these phosphates that's storing energy and just the right amount of energy. So that's why I call it the Goldilocks. Um, and it's not too much. So if somebody shows up, like a lot of you work in, in restaurants and places, if somebody pays with a hundred or a thousand dollar bill, you're like, well, I can do a thousand dollar bill. I don't have change to make for that. And so if the energy in this bond was too much, we can never build it up uh, or it would break if we get too much energy at once. Uh, and if, if somebody comes and pays you in pennies, which really that happens, uh, that would be useless because we couldn't make enough of this molecule. So every time the bond broke, we just get a few pennies out of it. And so it's just the right amount of energy that's being stored in there. The thing that's really cool, those who have not just chemistry, but maybe biology, this is also with just one phosphate. This is part of RNA. And then you can take off here, you get a molecule that A in the ACGT for DNA. Uh, so our body's actually thrifty. They keep using the same molecule. And we'll keep seeing this molecule in different places. Uh, this adenine is when it's attached to the ribose, 
it's adenosine, and that's actually a neurotransmitter, and that's the one that makes you feel sleepy. And then caffeine is the one that actually mimics. Um, and so caffeine has a couple of methyl groups, carbon groups on it, and it, it actually will bind to that receptor and block it. Uh, and so you feel alert. And so that's actually how caffeine which is pretty cool. Our body just keeps reusing the same molecule in different ways. Uh, and so when all three phosphates are on there, it's like a fully charged molecule. And when it only has one or two, it doesn't have much charge. Uh, and the other piece we need to talk about is the mitochondria. And the mitochondria, when you learn about it, you learn about actually like fifth or sixth grade, and you have to talk about the different parts of the cell. Uh, you're always the powerhouse of the cell. So that's where we make most like 95, 98% of our ATP is going to be made in the mitochondria. And so every cell has multiple ones of them. People who exercise have more mitochondria because uh, as you're working out, your cells will make more because you're needing more energy. That's not actually advantageous because they have found the more mitochondria you have because there's something else that's going to come out of the mitochondria and that's free radicals. So if you have too many mitochondria, you're going to make a lot of free radicals and we'll get to that. That's that last question that keeps showing up on every study set because it's really important. But um, there's, uh, there's several mitochondria and you're showing them here in green and this is one of my favorite pictures of a mitochondria because it looks like a cradle, but it has a double membrane, which is actually really important. And they think it was a cell and another cell involved it, but it was so good at making energy that it lived in symbiosis and cells evolved from that. The other thing that's really cool, well, these are just tons and tons and tons of protein. It's just loaded with enzymes because all those enzymes are making ATP. There's one that makes ATP, but there's like this 36 step elegant place. So what we're gonna have to do is get our food in us and not just get it in the cell, but we have to eventually get it into the mitochondria. So the mitochondria can then take, and all it needs is the electrons from your food is, and that's why we eat crap food and the people are still surviving. The other thing that's kind of cool is the mitochondria actually has DNA in it. So not all your DNA is actually in the nucleus. You actually have, every mitochondria. And something else that's really cool, um, you know, the egg and sperm come together and all you get from dad is half of your DNA. That's not actually true. Because all your mitochondria, all of your cellular organisms come from the egg, from mom. And so all the DNA in your mitochondria comes from mom. So actually it's like 51%, 52% of your DNA actually came from We were in Nepal hiking, I kept bemoaning that poor Joey was stuck with my mitochondria because Stas Sherpa and has much superior mitochondria to mine because he's like walking around in flip flops singing songs and I'm like, uh, like doing crazy math problems to try to forget. But I was, uh, I was very mindfully walking because I had to walk extremely slow to the powerhouse of ourselves uh, and like all that comes from mom. Uh, this is also just more a little trivia thing that when you take anatomy, you learn about the red blood cells actually have no mitochondria. So when they're made in your bone marrow, they're a full cell, but then they lose all their organelles uh, and they just become a little magnet to carry oxygen around. And that's important because mitochondria needs the oxygen. So if the red blood cell had a mitochondria, it would keep all the oxygen for itself and instead of sharing. Uh, and so once the red blood cell differentiates, it actually loses everything inside of it and it becomes, and another thing that's really cool, I'll take a pass this slide, uh, is these guys, the centrioles, they didn't know what they were, uh, but they're, they're these empty things in there. And they think what they are is they're little antennas that pick up vibrations. And so I mentioned this in the last class and I'll talk about it next week a little bit, that we actually communicate by vibrations because that allows like, beyond instantaneous, like you don't have to wait for a clunky molecule. So we're gonna talk about ATP, which is really a clunky molecule, but they think the centrioles are how they're picking up vibrations from the other cells. Um, anyway, all right. I'm gonna have to you too. And yeah, you can make your cells look any way you want. It's made of my pretty pony grenade. I don't actually know what my, it's a unicorn. It's 
So this is when I teach biochemistry. Uh, we talk about as the four stages of metabolism. I think this might be one of the questions also in your homework. So we're going to walk through these four stages. Um, but the first thing is we eat our food and we digest it. So we'll walk through them on the slide. But we eventually get ATP down here. And so we have the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. It's that like from a biochemist point of view. Um, and the first step is going to be digestion. So that's going to be our first step. And we're going to have, we talked about this before when we did the rest and digest, the mindful eating week. Um, but we're going to look at it again briefly. Our digestive system, right, is going from our mouth to where we poop the food out um, in our large intestine. And a lot is going on. Um, yes, here she says, your liver is part of your digestive system. Your pancreas, because that's where a lot of things are going on. Oh, wait, no, no. Uh, that's just another one that just walks through all the different parts. It's probably from uh, anatomy book. Um, I don't know what I was going to say. This is one of the questions in your homework. And we talked about this before, and it's really important. So we're going to talk about it again. So our stomach has stomach acid. And in our culture, it's blamed for everything. Why does your stomach have stomach acid? This was a question you guys had several weeks ago when we were studying protein. Because what the acid does is it denatures the proteins. Remember, proteins are these beautiful three-dimensional blobs. And to be able to digest them, which means to cut them into individual amino acids. So digestion means we're taking the macromolecules, the carb, um, so we have carbohydrates, we have proteins, and we have fats. And we're going to break them down into fatty acids, amino acids, and glucose, um, or glucose, or whatever you have. So that's what's happening in digestion. And you need enzymes to do that step. That acidity is allowing the protein, this huge three dimensional thing, to unwind some so that the enzymes can do their work. And so if your stomach is not acidic, which we have all these medications to make our stomachs not acidic, then you're not going to digest your proteins properly. The enzymes that digest your proteins, a lot of them are working in your stomach and they actually need to work at that low pH. Um, and so it gives a very different viewpoint of that. Uh, the lining, your stomach has this beautiful mucus lining, and that was, if you remember, the essential fatty acids is what provides that. And so perhaps we're looking at it from the wrong point of view. When people are starting to have problems with that, it's probably their diet is not that healthy as that it could be. Um, and there's also, right, these are, when you see the ACE ending, those are names of enzymes. And these are just different enzymes in different parts of your digestive part, um, digestive system. So your mouth does release a little bit of amylase. It's actually a very small amount. Um, it is, its actual purpose is to tell your pancreas to release all these other enzymes into your stomach and your small intestine. Your small intestines is huge. It'll go all the way around this room. And that's where a lot of digestion is going. But it does start in the stomach. The churning of your stomach is important. Uh, fiber is going to release stuff slowly so the small intestine can do its job. And so if you're not eating food that's fiber, uh, it's going to get passed into your small intestine really fast and get absorbed really fast. So the first part of your small intestine is called the duodenum or duodenum, depending on your teacher. Uh, and a lot of people call it the second stomach because that's where a lot of <coughs> enzymes are doing their job. Um, that's breaking carbs, proteins, and fats down. Uh, and then there's some more going on later on. There's also bacteria throughout all of your digestive tract, different parts in the different areas uh, that actually also are helping out. Uh, the other thing happening in your stomach is there is uh, calcium. This is where my understanding is calcium absorption. And so when your stomach pH is not low enough, uh, it doesn't actually, you don't absorb calcium 
which is interesting because so antacids, which they give a lot of people, actually neutralize uh, your stomach pH. Our pH of our stomachs is actually not the lowest. Carnivores is actually much lower because uh, we don't actually eat only meat. So carnivores only eat meat. And so the pH, our stomach actually doesn't have an acidic enough pH to digest meat as well as we would like. This is just again showing the different enzymes and the idea that what is happening in digestion is this enzymatic thing where you're breaking these big molecules in smaller pieces. And there's pictures of a protein uh, that we have to unwind it to break it into individual amino acids. Uh, and you can buy like a lot of people be prescribed digestive enzymes to take when they eat. Uh, if if you you go into this bag where you're going to decide to take digestive enzymes, uh, if you take them not with your food, they're pretty useless because that's the purpose of them. Uh, the other question is how well are they going to work because they have to pass through your stomach. Your stomach's going to digest them. These enzymes are released from your pancreas into the pancreas. <laughs> They're not going to be released into your stomach. Um, and then also when we're talking about this, a reminder that 90%, so serotonin is your happy neurotransmitter. There's actually a whole bunch that deal with happiness. Uh, it, it's made from this amino acid and 90% of the receptors are actually in your tummy. Uh, in your stomach. And so that's something to ponder that when you don't eat a good meal, right, that you really did eat crap, you do notice your mood is different. If you remember way back the first week, you guys had to do a three-day diet analysis and some of the things I asked you to look at, and some of you continue to say these things, is what's your mood been like in the past? It's not fair to eat some full moon yesterday, which does whack things out um, if you're sensitive to that. But we're past the full moon of tilt. Um, yeah. And yeah, so most of them are in your, right? Not most, it's 90%. And it is actually because serotonin, we think of it as a happy neurotransmitter, but it regulates the movement of your small intestine. Uh, and so when you do start eating healthy, uh, the thing is, is three days it can take for food to pass through. And so you can be affected. It's not necessarily the food you had the day before. You really have to look back over the past three days. So you may have just eaten really healthy and you're feeling terrible because that healthy food is trying to get all that stuff that's stuck in there uh, passing through you. Gluten is like the evilest, uh, the new gluten, the way we've modified it because it takes almost two weeks to go through. And in the meantime, it's like doing nasty stuff to your small intestine. Um, right. So the other thing that targets serotonin is meditation. So there's a beautiful, I actually have earrings, I could have worn those today. So uh, when you have low serotonin, you have uh, depression or uh, issues with anger. So, and a lot of people actually go back and forth between them. Uh, and so we can give you drugs to regulate your serotonin, or you can learn to meditate and laugh. And, and that was one of the things with blue zones is why I wore blue is because that's your theme this week is the blue zones is one of their parts is that point of finding joy and meditation. And again, I talked about this before. There's actually been tons of studies. You guys found lots of new ones where they've looked at meditation uh, and the production of serotonin and it always received increase. Okay, uh, and just a reminder, also your microbiome. So if we're talking about digestion, it's not just about our food it, for feeding us and ourselves. It's also feeding these guys. And these guys want to eat. You should all know the answer by now. Uh, they want fiber of food. They want real fiber, not fake fiber, uh, which is going to be legumes. And some of you are loving the legumes, like me. And some of you um, are learning to love them. And you do, it's finding, finding your path to it and fruit. Um, it's, it's really the fruit and the legumes that they love as well as vegetables and other stuff. They're not liking the process. So this is something in here I haven't talked about yet. Um, we have, yeah, we have a holiday and then a snow day, but 
uh, and it's something called short chain fatty acids. And so they've been after that golden bullet that's going to like turn off your hunger so that you, you don't overeat and stuff. And that was actually something I forgot to also mention when I talked about Okinawa, that, that one lady I showed a picture of, they did an interview of her. And you might hear this, if you pick one of those videos to watch. Uh, and she said, you, you always stop eating when you're 80% full. And I have not mastered that part yet, but um, that was one of her keys to it. But anyway, the magic bullet of how to turn off your hunger that you are, okay, I'm 80% full, uh, let's stop eating. And they finally found it and it's a short chain fatty acids. So a fatty acid has this group at the end and it, these are just two or three or four or five carbons. Um, most of the fatty acids we're getting in our diet are gonna be super long, like 18, 20 um, carbons. The amino acids. They're an acidic group, and so this is how many carbons they have on them. And these you can't get in your diet. You can take them as a pill, but it doesn't do it. They have to be made in your body, and they are made by your microbiome when they're happy and partying on fruit and legumes. Um, and then that travels up to your brain and tells your brain you're satisfied. Uh, and again, the fiber like the fake fiber supplements people will take, doesn't do it, doesn't all that does is make you poop. And so you need real fiber. Uh, your microbiome speaks the whole rest of your body. It's like our master communication, uh, which is really fascinating. And again, a lot of the talks they, they didn't realize um, our DNA, they have a lot of our DNA, um, but there's, there are about 53% of the cells in our body are bacterial. Uh, and I talked about that people do this thing where they think they can take pills to make their microbiome better. And there's all this stuff about probiotics and prebiotics. Uh, it's really eating real food so that you get to a place where you're sustaining yourself in a healthy way and you're not having to deal with supplements and stuff. And you can see this is a lot of um, the diversity, but a lot of different legumes and finding your favorite legumes for the healthy gut. Uh, so enzymes breaking down, this is just again. So we're going from single molecules, from large molecules into individual ones. Uh, this actually was a picture I just found and I was like, oh, this is perfect for our class. So we take food in and this is our first step is we digest the food. So we have the big molecules in our food and we broke it down. Problem in this day and age, before I move on to these other steps, is um, the food we're getting is not these big molecules anymore. It's processed carbohydrates and there's no fiber. And so it's getting broken down super fast. And so these steps are going way too fast. And then it gets clogged up in your large intestine because you need fiber to make it pass through your large intestine. So we want it to go slow through these steps. So everything gets absorbed and then gets fast through here. And that's what fiber does. And so fast food is fast because it's absorbed fast. And then it just sits there clogging you up. Um, so this was pretty cool because the next step is we have to absorb the food. It's got to go from our belly, our small intestine. It has to be absorbed and get to every cell in your body. And then once we're in the cell, which we're going to talk about for the rest of the class, we do what is my fascination, which is called assimilation. <clears throat> and it was actually reading a meditation thing that I went and found this slide uh, because they kept using the word assimilation show in, in yoga and in ancient yogic sciences, they actually talk about there's five values um, in your body, movements of things. And one of them is the one that um, moves food, assimilates it. And they show it as um, they're either moving up or down or out, and then this body. So it's a movement of things. So like our lungs breathing, um, elimination is one. Uh, and this is called assimilation. So they show it as a spiral because it has to get into the cells and be transformed somehow magically into this energy, which is pretty cool. Um, this assimilation step is where all the biochemistry that we're gonna break it down into a couple more steps. Um, but we've digested it and we need to absorb it. So again, if there's no fiber, this is happening super fast. Um, and then it's getting, actually your body thinks there's too much food. 
Um, uh, we're going to talk about, so we're in the cells. We absorbed, we got into the cells, and now something has to happen. And so the watch is, this is our first step, I guess. Um, what's going to happen is all of your food, you get into the cells. We're now inside the cells at this point. That's the absorption part. And the assimilation is that these guys all have to get broken down into a two carbon group, which is called the fetal group. Just because you'll probably hear me say that word. And then it's going to go through what's called the um, friend cycle or the sister gas cycle. And then it goes into what's called the EGC. So for me as a biochemist, I'm looking at digestion and absorption as one big step. And then all of these are my other steps, whereas that previous slide, they're looking at it as digestion, absorption, and they're saying this is all one big step. Um, and so it just depends on your viewpoint. But the glucose has to get inside the cell. And so how does it get to the cell, right? We're absorbing it. It's now in our bloodstream. It's floating around. But we have to get it in the cell for the cell to make it into, at this point, we get our ATP. So we have to, to, to be able to do the assimilation. And so there are actually four hormones that regulate this, which is fascinating because most people go, I thought there was only one. That was all about insulin, right? And so that is going to be one of them. Uh, and, and so insulin is a key. It's a hormone. It's released by your pancreas. And it's an extremely important hormone. And it is released when we eat food by the pancreas. And it goes to all the cells in your body and it says, food is here. Insulin itself never enters the cell. So it's like this room when I get here, I have a key, I open the door, and then I leave the key in the door and I come in. I don't do that. I put my because I've left it too many times in the door and then I don't have my keys. You've all done that at some point. Um, so it, it, it's telling the cells, food is here. And then the cells bring the food in. They open the gate and let the food in. Um, they're trying to show this as it's a little protein. Uh, the receptor is also a protein. So insulin saying food is here. So what is insulin going to tell your cells to do with the food? It's saying you got to do something with the food. And insulin is actually telling your body to store it. So every time you eat, you release insulin. And insulin is telling your body, here's food, store it away for those lean times when we don't have food. So it's actually an anabolic hormone. Uh, and it's telling you to put everything away. That's how you need to burn. So that, that we'll talk about with intermittent fasting is we have become where we eat all the time. We are convinced by the media that's constantly thrown at us, by Facebook, by all the social media that you need to be eating all the time. And that's gonna keep releasing insulin and you're just gonna keep storing. You can't burn and store at the same time. You can try it at home in your garage. You clean your garage and store stuff really at the same time. It usually doesn't work. Uh, there has to be a counterpart to insulin because when you're not eating, when you're asleep, we have to always maintain a certain amount of glucose in our blood. So there's that perfect window, right? Like between 80 and 100 ish of glucose always in our blood. So when you're eating, you're getting all this glucose coming in. So insulin's saying, take it in, take it in. We don't want all this glucose going around and your cells suddenly have all this glucose and do something. But at night when you're sleeping or when you're fasting, you're not eating for several hours, your pancreas actually releases the counterpart, which is called glucagon. And so that's the counterpart. And glucagon is the exact opposite it says we need glucose. We have to always have a certain amount of glucose. The cells have certain maintenance things that they're always doing that they need glucose for. Um, and so we'll see that on a, a slide a little bit later on. Um, so glucagon actually only interacts one place. It goes to your liver. So your pancreas is right here and your liver's right next door. And glucagon goes to your liver and it tells the liver, you have to release some food for everybody. So your liver is a storage place for glucose. Insulin, on the other hand, is going to go to all the cells in your body and say, here's food, here's food. Um, 
And so insulin is really important because people who've had their pancreas compromised in some way uh, are going to take insulin injections. Uh, although a lot of people, the vast majority of people, don't actually need the insulin, but that's where we are at this point with it. Um, and it is a it is a protein. That's kind of what my picture up there. Uh, so you can't take it by mouth because your stomach will digest anything that's a protein. So think about this. All people do collagen. Collagen is a protein, and you're taking it by mouth. It's going to get digested by your stomach. It's been really fascinating to me, the whole push of taking in collagen. Uh, so insulin is injected into some muscle so that it can be absorbed directly into the bloodstream and go and tell your body, hey, food is yum. Um, and so this is the idea that glucose insulin binds. It's never, this is the inside of the cell. Uh, it's binding its receptor. And I picked this picture because I kind of wanted to emphasize that Receptor is huge. Receptor, this is a cell membrane we briefly talked about. Those of you taking 106 with me, we have spent a lot of time on cell membranes with the core and the, uh, And what this is saying is insulin goes through a whole bunch of steps. Um, and then this is the glucose gets to enter. So there's usually a block that doesn't allow glucose in. And so there's this little transporter that allows it to come in, uh, as well as the fatty acids and the amino acids. So it's not just glucose. It's all these things are getting taken into the cell. Um, and so again, insulin is the key and once it binds the glucose uh, and the other stuff can enter. This is just saying that insulin is interacting with all different parts of your body. And the thing that's interesting here is just to remind you um, when insulin's released is actually interesting. It makes you hungrier, which that doesn't make sense because you've just eaten, right? Uh, but it is here that we're going to actually start storing. Um, and this is interesting. It's causing mitochondrial dysfunction, right? Like some of these things that we know, and so insulin's been promoted, it's a save all, but it's actually promoting the synthesis of things and lipids to accumulate um, because it turns out, oh, and inflammation. And selling adipose tissue to start storing. So lipogenesis, genesis means to make, and you're going to build lipid. So insulin is actually telling your body, here's food, do something with it, which is to store the food. And so it's promoting the increase in adipose tissue and uh, glycogen and stuff. Um, and so we absolutely need that because we are not going to eat 24 7, even though a lot of people do right now and their body is totally out of whack. Um, so this is just another picture, and again, it's just emphasizing that it's telling our body to store stuff. Uh, adipose is your fat, and it, lysis means to break down here. So you can't break down fat when the insulin is being released everywhere. The way you break down fat is to exercise. Um, and so this is that terrible spiral. But most Americans are in is that you eat food, you have, you're hungry, you eat food, and your body releases insulin, and the cells take in the insulin or, or take in the food, the insulin binds the cells. But the problem is the cells are already full. Your cells weren't hungry. Your cells are like, I, I can't take it anymore. So your cells are like, no, no more. So they become resistant to the insulin and they stop responding. And that's not good because then the glucose is out there just floating around and it's a really good oxidizer if you have too high of levels. And the other thing that likes glucose is mold. And so you start having issues with yeast. I think every female is going to have, if they haven't, will have at some point in their life an issue with yeast uh, or mold. And you just feel terrible all the time because mold compromises your immune system. Um, there's ways to deal with it. There's ways to get rid of it. And a lot of that has to do with eating healthy and getting the balance. Um, and so this is, I don't know why the bunny is there, but they you know, there two or love and go. Insulin is telling your body to store it, so it's actually anabolic. And then glucagon would actually be the opposite, which would tell you 
Um, so insulin is telling us to synthesize and store stuff, and glucagon is down here telling us to break down um, when we're in a time, like when we're sleeping and we want stuff to go on. All right, so that was two of the hormones. That says there's four. That is one of the homework questions, right? Uh, the other two are your stress hormones. So they regulate glucose. So whenever you're stressed, yeah, you need, <laughs> you need more glucose than normal. So you guys are just hanging out, sitting there. I'm getting to walk around and stuff. And so I'm going to use more. I'm not stressed. Um, but when you, if you really saw like the beer running after you, you need adrenaline, which means you have to release glucose. So there's only two places in your body that you can store glucose. And that is your muscle store them, but they only store them for themselves, for this situation uh, and your liver. And so adrenaline is telling your liver and your muscles, you gotta start with your liver, you have to start breaking down the glucose stored and release it to the muscles. The muscles already have some, but they're gonna use up their supply if you're really dealing with a stressful situation. The issue is now is that we're not really having this kind of stressful situation. Uh, we're dealing with stress where it's completely fabricated and we're not even moving, right? Because a lot of you probably are doing that even right now. You're creating scenarios in your head, some conversation that happens, some distraction you have going on, right? That somebody said something to you. I mean, it's it's wonderful because you guys don't have your cell phones out. You're like trying to answer because there was a lot of homework questions this week. Uh, but whenever adrenaline is released, it's called it's called adrenaline because it's released by your adrenals. So your adrenals again are these little above your kidneys and your back, uh, cortisol is always released. And this is hydrophobic. And so it needs a boat to carry it around. Adrenaline is hydrophilic. We see all the OHs, they look like water. This one, there's just too much other stuff. It's too big of a molecule. Um, and so cortisol takes the slow boat to your liver. It only goes to one place, and that's your liver. And it tells your liver, we're gonna run out of glucose. You have to start making new glucose. So I mentioned this word the other day, gluconeogenesis. Uh, so that neo means new. We're going to generate new glucose, and you're going to make it from your storage of proteins, from your gluteus maximus that's right there. It's going to start being broken down, and those proteins, those amino acids, are going to get changed into glucose by your liver. Because your liver says, we need more glucose. We've been running from this beer. Uh, but you really weren't. You were just sitting in the class distracting yourself with daydreams that weren't beautiful daydreams. You should really make beautiful daydreams. If you're going to daydream, make it worth it. Um, yeah. And so you didn't actually need those proteins that broke down and became glucose. You didn't need the glucose. So what's going to happen to that glucose? Well, it turns out it doesn't go back to protein. Your liver goes, it's going through your blood, your bloodstream goes, there's too much glucose, your liver takes it in, and guess what it's gonna make? Fat. Makes it into fat, and it stores it right around there. And so that is the stress fat. You can just walk out to the store and see. We're, we're in a really blessed time because here on campus, we don't have so many people, and everybody walking around campus seems to be very healthy and stuff, but if you go to the store, so we've talked about this, right? Is it real stress, like a tiger is staring at you? Uh, or is it, I tell you, when I was in Nepal, this is 30 years ago, we took the one to take me to the top of this place where something happened, Buddha, a lioness said Buddha. Uh, and so we're on his motorcycle, and it's in the, at that time, it was in the middle of nowhere, we're on this dirt road going up a hill, and the motorcycle dies, like something happened. And so we have to then push the motorcycle like at least 10 kilometers. And it wasn't going to happen for me. I'm not strong enough. And he was pushing it. And, and he stopped at one point and he pointed in the dirt and showed me a track of a tiger. And we're both just looking at that. It was very different than when you go to the zoo and you're like, oh, look, there's a tiger. It's like, I don't know nowhere. I haven't seen any people for over an hour on a motorcycle. Now I'm walking. Um, Anyway, it was, I'm sure there was some cortisol release and that probably gave him the strength to keep moving his motorcycle. And I pretty much collapsed when we got down and got to the restaurant, but um, which probably was because of the thoughts of, we just gotta keep moving and 
um, hopefully the best. So glycogen is how we normally would store glucose, but cortisols, the adrenaline broke down the glycogen. And so cortisol is saying we have to make new glucose. But you never actually broke down the glycogen because you weren't doing anything. And right, so you learn about the stress response of all the things that are happening in all the organs, but the cellular level, it's not very pretty. Um, and so that's why I talked about this. So the sympathetic response is the fight or flight, which is epinephrine or adrenaline. There is an opposite response, and that is the parasympathetic. So this is not, um, and that is. The idea that when we're eating, we want to be in a restful place. We want to take that time to really sit and eat. Um, and those of you who've done yoga, a true yoga class, the purpose of yoga is for those last 10 to 20 minutes, which is shavasana, uh, which is you lay down in bliss, nothing's on your mind, and you go into a deep meditative state. Uh, and it is to reset your body to get it out of this whole place. And what's very fascinating to me when I did um, yoga, because I didn't know this, because I had no problem getting into this place. I never have. Um, but I didn't know that all these people who were sitting next to me, who they were like, oh man, I'm doing my whole grocery list and stuff. And I'm like, you just did like an hour of yoga, like gentle stretches, and you're not going to enjoy the best part of it. I need to make your grocery list when you get to the grocery store. Um, but anyway, so if you're always stressed, we've talked about this before, but your stomach pH is not low enough then. And so you're not going to digest food. The other thing when your stomach pH is not low enough, uh, which is going to happen from all the fake stuff, medications they give us, but also from stress that actually raises the pH of your stomach, uh, the pyloric gate doesn't open. And so food's not going to get go through you correctly. Um, yeah, so there's the stress. Uh, and that's where we get the acid reflux. Um, that's happening. And it's actually because the pH of your stomach is too high. But we look at acid reflux as, oh, it's too acidic. And we're treating it to keep the pH high. when that's actually going to keep the situation there. Um, there's like a thing going on. I never heard of this before. And you could say, oh, we just finally have the surgery to do it. But I've known several people who've had to have um, part of this area altered because they have issues with they're always um, nauseous and throwing up and they can't eat. And it's really um, fascinating to me because although there's been issues like that in the past, there just seems to be a plethora of it. And it must go back that instead of, yeah, yes, we do need surgery to do it, but are we eating the right food to keep this area as healthy as possible? Uh, vitamin B12, we do finally get, we're going to talk about vitamins. We did talk about them, we're going to see them again. Uh, B12 is absorbed with, uh, and that has to do with the intrinsic factor and stuff. And so if your pH of your stomach is not low enough, you'll have a B12 deficiency and you'll be in. Uh, so if you don't have enough B12, you're also not going to have enough whole, and that's the anemia that comes from, and protein's not broken down, and your microbes, uh, and you're going to feel bloated. Um, and so it's that's the thing with the blue zones, that the thing that these people, and actually this is before the blue zones, when they looked at people who lived to 100, the one thing they all had in common was not their diet. It was they were all low key people. They dealt with stress and they moved on um, and they didn't dwell on it and dwell on it. And so it's learning that to let go of the things you, you really need to let go of, that everything works out in the end, how it's supposed to be. Um, yeah, and so we're just going to go through. So the idea is adrenaline has you always in the place of fear, or if you're always in the place of fear, you're going to always be releasing this and causing those issues. Uh, whereas if you're in the place of feeling love, you're going to release other types of hormones and neurotransmitters that are going to make you always feel good. I had a student yesterday who was asking me, they had to pick an element to talk about because we want to know an element that had to do with pets. Um, 
anyway, she was getting at it that she'd heard talk about oxytocin. Uh, so oxytocin is the one when you have pets or when you're in love, go with your pet whenever you're petting them. That's why they go into a bliss place because of the oxytocin, you feel that bonding to them. It's also the one that's released, the mother love is released at birth for both the mosh and the baby. That's why you don't feel flip up hormones that happen. So just always choosing love and joy actually helps to put you in this place. When you're feeling the stress, it's to take a moment. And instead of, remember we talked about that research in the last class, instead of thinking about yourself, take a few deep breaths and think about somebody else. Maybe the person who's really pissed you off. And just think about them and send them a blessing. It's really hard to do at first because you're like, want to be really mad at them, but really so just let go and send them love because they're in a bad place too. Uh, and one of you has to make that first step. You don't even have to tell them that you did that, but sending them a blessing. Um, I think I told you guys, I heard a talk from this woman who's a Buddhist um, monk and, and they do a meditation with that. And, and it is, you eventually have to send the troublesome person. That's what they call it, the troublesome person in your life, love, um, right? So always find joy. Uh, and she always says, because you're somebody's troublesome person. So, and you can all ponder who's troublesome person you are. But always finding that playful moment and just playing. All right, so glucose enters the cell and apparently I didn't animate this slide. So we're just getting a lot of information at once. So glucose gets into the cell. We need to get the mitochondria. So remember the very beginning I talked about the mitochondria? And we're not even there yet. Um, and so we get in the cell. All that stuff with the hormones was trying to get how does glucose get in the cell? How do we make more glucose? Um, there was somebody who, who wrote a really fun note in their G bombs, and they said at the end, This has been so cool. I've been really enjoying this. I feel like I need a nutrition part too. Um, and so my Ken 106, we, we look at a lot of stuff and we get to look at it a little bit slower, but not much. And, and I would love if this would be split into two terms um, that I could spend more time, like weeks, on just each one of these slides and talk about it more. Um, but these are the different things that could happen to glucose. And they're really big words. Um, and so I apologize, I didn't have to animate this slide. Um, but let's just look at the words and not worry. You guys aren't gonna be tested. So you don't have to, in Chem 106, we have tests, but we'll deal with it then. So you can deal with the G words. You can ask Regina, she loves the G words. Everybody loves the G words. And those of you who've taken anatomy, you remember your test on the G words in, in the metabolism. So whenever you see that ending lysis, that means you're breaking it down. And this is that you're breaking down glucose to make ATP. So this means we're gonna be continuing through this. That's like, great, that's what we want. That's what we thought this was all about. I'm saying the glucose is in the cell it doesn't actually go to that necessarily. It is gonna go to this though. Uh, you're, let's say you're Delaney and she's playing softball and she's out there doing stuff. Absolutely. Or you're running, right? Or you're walking your dog. Yeah, absolutely. This is going to happen because your cell is needing energy because you're moving, you're using it. And even when you're asleep, your cells are doing stuff. Your muscles are relaxing. Your brain is finally relaxing. Uh, so this second one, we just call it the PPP because everything starts with P, but um, the pentospotic path. And again, it's a lot of words. I didn't mean to all show up there, uh, but it is to make ribose. And what ribose is, is how you make DNA. That every time your cell replicates, DNA is beyond the biggest molecule. There is no, when we say it's the biggest molecule, it's like comparing your bank account to Bill Gates' bank account. So comparing a protein to, right? So it's 3 billion. Each DNA molecule is 3 billion base pairs. Billion. We're not talking like, oh, it's made up of oxytocin and 12 amino acids, right? We're talking, right, that's like our bank accounts and 3 billion. So you suddenly have to, when the cell replicates, you have to make an exact duplicate of the DNA. Ponder if you're ever pregnant with a baby, like what's going on? Like, because your cells are replicating because you're building a whole baby inside of you. Um, but the DNA, you have to make 3 billion base pairs. So pretty much that cell is going to send ribose and glucose, like glucose, it's made from glucose. All the glucose is getting funneled here to make that. 
right? It was also was part of ATP. It was part of um, when you're making RNA. So there's always a background amount going to the PPP. This is going on all the time. But when your cell has to make DNA to replicate, become two cells, it's all pretty much getting sent into this pathway. Um, this word has demesis, and this word has demesis. And that is when glucose, instead of being broken down catabolic, it is being anabolic. It's being built into something. We're making it to store it for later. So these are going to happen when you're storing, that you weren't playing a softball game. Or it's after a softball game, you just ate two pizzas because you were so happy. And then, I don't know, chocolate chip, whole thing of Oreos. And you have all this glucose that you really didn't need. And it's going to start getting stored. So this is glycogen. So that's what it says, glycogen synthesis. Uh, that only happens in the liver and muscle. Your liver is the most altruistic organ in your body. So that means it loves all. It shares with everyone. It is for glycogen for the benefit of your whole body. Your muscles are the most selfish. I don't know if the brain is more selfish, but it would be a toss up between those. Other than your cardiac muscle, your heart muscle, but the other muscles, they store glycogen and they're never going to share. They're like, I got glucose, it's all mine. I don't need it right now, but I'm going to store it as glycogen and nobody's ever going to get it. And, and your liver is saying, okay, I'm going to store it for everybody. There are these little gnomes, these little creatures in your liver. And they have this little scale and they're measuring. And once you get to, and I think it's 5% of your liver is glycogen. I don't know who figured this out, but it has to be the gnomes, right? You don't make any more glycogen. The liver's like, okay, I'm good. This is as much as I can store. And so it doesn't store anymore. But there's still all this glucose that's coming in because you just ate a whole like gallon of ice cream. It's really good. But so meanwhile, <laughs> your liver needs that food and it's all coming in fast. Your liver's saying, oh my gosh. And it can only do this so fast or that. It's going to start shunting everything to this. This is extremely efficient. And that means fat storage. So lipid is fat. Genesis means, and so it's lipid. TG is triglycerides. That's the fancy medical word. Uh, and cholesterol. So high cholesterol is completely from your diet. Um, the thing that's really interesting is there's those different types of cholesterol now. And I, you know, you never heard about those small dents. We talked about it briefly, the small dents, and then the big fluffy. And it seems like the processed food, because it's being processed so fast and assimilated and then stored as cholesterol, it's like your body's just, it's like those snowflakes that were messed up. Uh, these are like, that must be what makes the small dents. That's my like little theory, um, as opposed to real food. And so meat is going to get, you're going to have cholesterol storage, but it doesn't seem to make it the small dense ones that all this processed food that really never existed 50 years ago. Um, and so we're seeing things that never happened before. Uh, so glucose does not necessarily, this does not, just because you took in food doesn't mean you end up with ATP. Uh, if you're taking in more food than your body, your cell can handle, your liver, this is all, glycogenesis is all in your liver. Uh, and this is why, I think it was back the first week that one of, one of the videos and several we picked it. Um, it was the guy Robert. I can't remember his name now. He's from down at UCSF. Uh, he his big thing is looking at children are having liver alcohol, uh, non-alcoholic liver syndrome uh, from all the high fructose corn syrup because the fructose is getting stored as lipid. Uh, the other problem though is how fast the glucose can be taken in because this glucose, you're getting this huge rush of glucose, which is not good. And that glucose is causing radical damage until it can get stored as some. Um, but the good news is always your body heals. Our body is really amazing. Uh, and so if you give it the mindset and the correct nutrients, 
particular. That was just uh, that we're making DNA and RNA, and so that was the post phosphate uh, and glycogen storage. And right. Uh, and then if you're just going to sit in the bathtub, which is pretty much what I see when you guys, I'm grateful. The first day, I should take a picture the first day when my students walk in this class because you all have your like Starbucks or Dutch Bros or something with you or your Red Bull. Some of you remember you came in with your can of Red Bull and even the second class and some of you are like looking at it, kind of trying to hide it. And so um, I'm really grateful. Uh, next term, it's 8.30 in the morning. I remember when I had that last year, I said, I think we're the only 8.30 in the morning class on campus where no one has like their... Well, they're and in one of six, it's it's a little bit later, so it's kind of lunchtime, and people start bringing. It's really cool to see because people start changing the food they bring in, and they start bringing in more fruits and nuts, and I don't know. It's it's that trying to figure out that change, and it does take time. Um, but my my goal is more that you have the tools because it, it is. A number of people said, it, you know, I just didn't have the right stuff. I go shopping, grocery shopping is taking longer. It does eventually go a lot faster. Because you know exactly what you're going to want to go in. You look for the stuff. You you basically stop shopping in the middle part because there's nothing in the middle that isn't any good. It's all in boxes. You just don't even notice it. All right. So we're pretending like you actually needed ATP. So we're going. This is still a simulation uh, that we're trying to make ATP. So the simulation was also. Again, that we could go through all of these, but if we broke down the ATP, if we broke down the glucose, it gets broken down into a two carbon group. Um, and this is, there is a question, and either says, why is the PrEP cycle? The PrEP cycle is considered a common catabolic path. This is completely catabolic at this point. Um, this has three different names, four different names. Uh, the original, the original name that Dr. Krebs gave that he won a Nobel Prize uh, was the tricarboxylic acid cycle or TCA. Nobody calls it that except in like a high biochem class. Uh, everybody calls it in the chemistry world the TREG cycle uh, to honor Dr. Krebs. It's also easier to say. And I've noticed in the anatomy world, they all call it the citric acid cycle, which is actually really funny because there is no such thing as citric acid. Um, your body always ionizes it into citrates. And this is one of the things when we talked about vitamins, I was like, a couple of you did actually show me the form of the vitamins. And that I do talk about it briefly next week. because so I get to cover all of them in one class. Um, you guys have two classes, and each one had to do one. But um, anyway, it's a cycle. And it just keeps going on. It's going on in all of your cells. And you're in the mitochondria at this point. So at this point, down here, we're in the mitochondria. So every cell, except your red blood cells, skin they have the mitochondria. Um, but this is, when we, when you take biochem with me, some of you are, uh, this cycle is really cool. Uh, and it's not making ATP. We're getting one thing down here. I thought I had the slide, but I don't. Um, there are, if, if you learned about DNA, I'm pretty sure most of you have, there's ACGT, learn about the four base pairs. Uh, there, there are four triphosphates. There's ATP, GTP, CTP, and they each actually have a niche use. So you'll sometimes see on my slides, they're from biochemical books, the correct way. Um, but we're not just making ATP yet. So what's going on in this cycle? The glucose doesn't show up because in the previous step, we made a two carbon group. Uh, and this two carbon group gets re, we, we keep regenerating. Two carbon group comes in. There's a lot of things going on though here I want to point out before I go on. And several of you, when you did your vitamin, mentioned it. So the B vitamins, um, I, I thought it was that anything with water soluble, they put with a B vitamin, which seems to be correct, uh, except for vitamin C. Uh, but the B vitamins are all involved. In metabolism somehow. So uh, B5, pentaphonic acid, is this guy up here, the CoA. It's coenzyme A. It, it brings the two, something has to carry this into the mitochondria. And so vitamin B5 does that uh, for all of them, for fat, for protein, whatever. Uh, and then the other one is this guy keeps showing up. And if you look, there's eight steps 
And three of them are making this purple molecule here, the NADH, and one of them is making FADH2. And that is niacin riboflavin. That's B3 and B2. And then one of the Bs, and I'm not going to name that for because uh, thiamine shows up somewhere, but it might be in previous step. Um, but all the B vitamins show up somewhere in this process. They have other uses too, but this is, and that's why they put them in there. Um, but anyway, that is actually what the Krebs cycle is doing. This is making these, these four guys, FAD and ADH. And something I said about 15 minutes ago is all you need from your food is electrons. And that's why you can eat crap food. You keep going. Because uh, any food has electrons in the bonds and stuff. And so that's why people can go on these low carb diets or these pure junk food diets or these high protein diets. I mean, well, high protein diets, they don't tend to survive very long. But um, this is a crazy picture. But the point is um, that what they show really little, but I don't like, but these are electrons that they're trying to show. And we're going to make this molecule, the, the NADH and the FADH2, they even show it on there. Uh, this is pentathonic acid, which is vitamin B5. And it's interesting to attach to that. We're going to move on. Maybe. All right. Uh, you can get, anyway, this is just my little thing that you can get the two carbon group. This is going to carry it and attach it here to the sulfur. The two carbon group comes from your food, and you can get it from any food, from Pringles, from bacon, uh, from berries. But it's these two guys. So the purpose of the Krebs cycle is to make these. And what they do is they get the electrons from your food. So that's all that's happening, is they get the electrons. The carbons, I didn't point it out, but the carbon, because I said it was two carbon, you blow them out. When you breathe out, you learn it when you're like four years old, you breathe out CO2. The carbon dioxide you're breathing out is the food, the carbon molecules you took in. The carbon is some of it. A lot of it's getting cooped out. Um, anyway, these are our vitamin B2 and B3. Uh, and the thing that's kind of cool, looking at molecules, you might be like, I'm um, tired for molecules. We're seeing an ADP hooked up to stuff. Uh, and there's our B two and our B3. Um, and they're carrying electrons that came from your food. And that's what the Krebs cycle does, is it gets those electrons there. And then we get to the last step where we can finally change those electrons somehow into ATP. So it's a whole idea of, oh, and it's, an, it's carrying electrons. So this is dealing with, there's a word called oxidation. Let's see why is that blow up there? But, um, we talk about oxidative stress, so smoking, bacon, all those things. And so that's why the red ox is there, because it is going to be dealing. Whenever you're dealing with electrons moving, there's oxidation happening. Uh, and we'll get to that. That is a later slide. And we'll worry about that. Oh, this is good for those of you who took. You guys remember Leo Gert? I know, I could have dressed up as Leo. So I totally blew it. And a red ox. I don't know. <laughs> you know why? Thanks. All that stuff is stuff in that other room. I have like all my slides. Um, and so we're going to talk about NMN because this is a question. This was the next slide that I didn't get to the other day. And so it fits in here too. I, it, it goes, the, the top of metabolism and the blue zones go together. Um, NMN is. Uh, being promoted as a fat and beauty. And I love this picture because it kind of reminded me of Nepal um, that the mountains are in the background, they're just huge, and you would get to drink straight from the streams. You're way up high, it was. It was great. Once you get out of Kathmandu and far enough away, here in Kathmandu, they say don't drink the water. You have to have a water filter, you have to treat it. But it's crazy because all these Europeans were coming. And they were treating this water. They weren't going to drink this water. I'm like, this is like, you know, what you know, this is from like you're away from the mountains. That's like the cleanest water on this planet. Um, anyway, uh, so NMN is completely related to what I was just talking about, which is the NADH. Probably Regina will get the most out of this because she took my Chem 106. So NADH is like, okay, 
I've heard about that. Uh, but when you have high levels of NADH, it actually is what's going, it's, it's what you're trying to make ATP. So everybody's heard of ATP, but the key to get to make the ATP is you need the electrons and the NAD carries them. Uh, and so you get this boost of energy when your NAD is higher. Uh, and your cells can repair themselves better because ATP is not just about moving your muscles, it's about your cells being able to do their normal functioning and stuff. Uh, when you go to middle age, this, this, I love this, I think this is directly plummet. Um, so when you go through menopause for a woman, your, your estrogen plummets, it really does. It goes like straight down. But anyway, it plummets to 50% of your youth. So most of you guys are probably, um, well, I don't know where the highest levels are. It could be when you're eight years old. So maybe we're all already on the plummet. But apparently uh, when you hit your middle age, they say you're, this is going to start sounding like an advertisement. Like I said, every journal article I read now sounds like an advertisement. Um, but this is true that these levels going to be plummeting. Um, now, you want high NAD because it turns out when your NAD like your H levels are good, you have, and sometimes they say NAD and NADH, and for purposes of this class, we're not going to worry about that. That's the oxidation reduction step. Uh, your insulin sensitivity is going to be better, which means you're going to respond to insulin in a much better way. Uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, we keep seeing that. So if your mitochondrial is dysfunctional, it means you're going to be producing a lot of free radicals rather than making the ATP. So you're not going to be working as efficiently as you should be. Because um, a lot of you probably ran into these words and a lot of you used these words in your papers, and I'm pretty sure you weren't sure what they meant. Uh, and this is there because it does extend lifespan. It says all these things. The next slide is the infomercial. All these things have been proven in rodents in my studies uh, and that's one of those pictures. That's in mitochondria. This is a cell membrane and there's mitochondria. And so the NAD need that in there. It's the same as a human cell. And there's the NMN. So NMN is the supplement that people are doing. I didn't know about this. I was doing to talk on it and then I, I was blown away. So this is, like a really wordy sentence here, but she was guys as a developmental biologist somewhere down Washington University. Um, so the precursor to NAD is called NMN. And some of you, especially if you're into athletics, may have heard of NMN and may may have supplemented with it or maybe stocked up on it. He's not supplemented with it anymore. Uh, but anyway, this is a quote from him. It's a critical systematic signaling molecule, uh, which it is. Uh, to maintain biological robustness. I was like, how can I word that better? Biological robustness. So what he's saying is we need the NAD because the NAD is what's made in the Krebs cycle that goes to the next step. And all it's carrying is electrons, which makes me wonder if we have this wrong, that maybe having lower NAD may help to protect you too, because I don't know, um, in this whole thing. Anyway, has to do with an NMN is the precursor to NAD. And so if we, as we started to realize that NMN is the precursor to NAD, that we could supplement with this and increase the level of NAD in our cells. And so it's a huge fad, huge. Um, like, I don't know if anybody in here has ever done it. I had no idea about this. Bike riders, people who cycle, because they're always beyond all, because they're the biggest dopers, like beyond everybody else out of all the dopers in the world, and they don't even add up. Um, but pretty much everybody who races in bicycles, they are doing testosterone, NMN, and probably other stuff. They want to, well, anyway. Uh, so apparently it decreases inflammation of your fat tissue. Sounds good. Uh, enhances your insulin secretion, your insulin action. All this stuff sounds like wonderful. Uh, your mitochondria function, I already kind of said this, your brain function. Um, and you will find tons of ads online. And they're always, they'll either have them as a muscle builder and they'll be, my experience, I took it for 12 days and everything changed. I had so much more energy because your cells are able to deal with 
have this now, which is that key step to carry those electrons to the last step. So you're eating food, this matter what food, you can keep eating crap as long as you're taking this supplement, except you can't anymore. Oh, and this is like at the end of the commercial. There is a small amount of vitamin if you eat your fruits and veggies. Uh, you're going to actually get a little bit in there. And our body must be made, but apparently these are the ones that have the most is avocado, broccoli, cabbage, adami, and uh, And this is this crazy picture, but uh, basically uh, vitamin B3, and we make NAD from it, is where it's coming from. So we, we synthesize most of it usually from B3. And so B3 you get from, um, yeah, we'll talk about it in here today, but you get it from pretty much all your food. Uh, and that is, there is speculation that if you have a healthy gut microbiome, it makes your B vitamins for you, which is going to produce the NMN. Um, and so there was this doctor I listened to, and I, I'm pretty sure I told the story before, but it's worth telling again. And she said all her patients were coming in with severe fatigue and inflammation and pain. This is years ago. Um, so this is nothing new. And she put them on B vitamins. She'd find they were all deficient in their B vitamins. And they are, if you look at a multi B, it's meant for increasing your cellular energy because it's helping these processes in your mitochondria, and especially B3 because of the NMN. Um, but what would happen is these people felt great then. They suddenly felt great and they had energy. But like two years later, they'd come back and they were depleted again. So that's why I'm wondering if this guy, after two years, uh, and what she realized finally, because it was right when the whole microbiome stuff, so microbiome is the key, that they actually think now microbiome might be what is producing our B vitamins for us. Uh, and so if you keep your microbiome healthy, you're going to help to keep this healthier. Um, and again, I already mentioned this, it declines with age. Uh, as well as the ability, apparently, to convert it. But the question is, if you're eating crappy food, which most people do, and they pretend they're stressed, uh, and let's see, can we move on? There we go. Uh, so this is like the infomercial more. This picture was pretty awesome that I found. It's not just that they're actually twins. I mentioned them. They're actually the exact same mouse. They're called transgenic mice, so they actually are given the exact same DNA. Um, so it's not like how we think of identical twins where it split the um, egg split after fertilization. And so they do have the same DNA and then they grow separate. Uh, these, these mice are like somehow injected. I forgot how it goes. But anyway, uh, these are all done in the mouse aging model and you have these remarkable effects. And you can see pretty much Everything is here. Um, I don't, yeah, I just, uh, insulin from heart disease, Alzheimer's, anything you can find. And it does sound like an infomercial. Uh, and so these mice, right, that this mouse aged regular, and this one was getting the NMN supplements. Uh, and so you're like, wow, where can I get one? Where can I get this? She's anti supplement. <laughs> He's helping my voice. I'm still anti supplement because you cannot get it actually. Um, and that's just some biochemists. And so there's NMN for anybody who wants to be really easy. But this is the part that's pretty crazy. The NMN actually has to react with an ATP molecule to make the NAD. Um, and so again, this is the fountain of youth. So it's suggested that it might help your metabolism to make you feel 10 to 20 years younger, which would be great. Um, and so wouldn't it be better? And so you see tons of these, you don't see these ads anymore. Uh, and I get to that on the next slide. But part of one of the things they put in there besides the NN and is resveratrol, uh, which comes from eating dark grapes. Uh, they throw in some vitamin C, and I don't know what form of vitamin C, because there are some forms of vitamin C that we do absorb. Uh, and then they take grape seed extract. And so Victoria talks about it really well that the grapes that actually have the seed which are harder to find in the grocery stores. It's like the local grape. Uh, and pine bark extract, which is another one. So it is, and I actually apologize because I think some of the options this week, um, it's hard for me to, a lot of the people who are really good at speaking 
have sold out and now have supplement companies. And so they're kind of selling their advertisements and stuff. Um, and so that's why some of, some of the stuff I will not put on there because it's blatantly in the middle, they stop and they're like promoting their supplement. Um, and so this is the guy, I have this picture in a moment. He is from Harvard, so who? Uh, and he's the big anti-aging researcher. And he's one of the, this is not him, but this is, I love these pictures, they were all over online. So you see the before and after, but it's like, did he just not have the capacity to smile before? And like, really, I can have you take a picture of the mugshot and then smile and it would, but anyway, he apparently, this is not David, I have his picture up next to David. Um, so anyway, on human trials, when people are taking NNN, uh, they apparently feel better because they have more energy and stuff. And this guy, David Sinclair, he does take NMN. I listened, I'm pretty sure he's one of your choices today. Uh, and there's a picture of him. He's all over on the, the things, the blogs and stuff where they are interviewing him. And uh, he says his lipid profile has completely changed and it's like 20 years younger me. His triglycerides are lower, his LDLs and HDLs and everything, all his markers are beautiful and um, that he has more energy and his blood markers are more that he's like a 30 year old. Um, that. And so he's actually one of the big researchers behind resveratrol and then into the searchins, uh, which are one of the ones behind intermittent fasting, but um, and looking at them in yeast and um, the little nematodes and stuff. Uh, and he has a supplement business, which is really interesting. And so if you pick his talk, he may actually, in the middle, start promoting the NADH. Um, and so just, you know, you can listen, because this is the part that's an interesting twist, that in October, just six couple months ago, our FAD, FDA, FAD, right? FAD is the molecule here. FDA actually said, you can no longer buy NMN as a supplement. And so people started hoarding. And it is completely, Amazon announced last week, they're no longer selling it. So I don't know how the FDA blocked it and Amazon was able to sell anything they had left for the past few months, but Amazon is no longer selling it apparently. I didn't actually take the time to look, it's getting fair enough to look. Um, but anyway, this is him. I did put the irreverent picture of him, but somebody had said that. I don't know if this is him saying that it was his urine and his urine. If he drank his urine, he would live longer and stuff. But um, anyway, I he he's quite very much a Harvard um, professor when you hear him talking. Uh, but it is also a really good talk. But this is it's also it's all over NMN's all over. I had never actually heard of it. Um, and anyway, it's no longer, it is no longer a supplement. You cannot get it. And so I was like, why? What happened? Um, like, did something really like, and it turns out they didn't say why, except for this. It turns out that there's a drug developer. And I didn't like research into who these people are. And I wondered if there was connection to this guy and that drug developer. Uh, but anyway, it's going to become a drug. Which means you're going to have to pay a lot more and doctors will start getting money and these pharmaceutical companies have the market on them which is really interesting this is what fda did so we're talking about the snowflakes out there but makes you think it's great what, what's really going on here um so that's why i said i don't think you can get it anymore i haven't gone and looked to see um, I do know I used to see it in the store. I had a student who did a talk on it. But the whole NMN thing comes from this idea that this cycle is making this molecule NADH, uh, which is made in your mitochondria from the NMN. Uh, but it is made by vitamin B3. Uh, FAD also is made from B2. And that this cycle is making a lot of things. Uh, your feedback control is that when you go to sleep at night, the buildup of these molecules is going to slow the whole cycle down. Uh, and when you start becoming active, uh, these molecules are going to be used up because they're going to go to the next step. Anyway, I thought it was pretty cool with the NMN. So 
I don't know much about it other than the precursor for this. And so you're feeding this molecule, you're making sure your mitochondria has tons of it, um, and you're ready to go, go, go. So we have to make the ATP. We still haven't made ATP yet. This whole talk was how do we get energy? Um, and so there's the citric acid cycle. Uh, this is Right, these are the molecules, the NADH is what they're showing here. And what they're carrying is just the electrons from your food. No carbon, no hydrogen, no oxygen, none of that matters. And that's why you can eat anything. You can eat cardboard and it's gonna have electrons. These have to be break down the cardboard to get to the electron. Uh, the CO2 is the carbon and oxygen from your food that you're basically blowing any of, any of the food, the actual food that got into your cells. Uh, but these go right, they're still in the mitochondria, and this is the cell membrane. And this is the membrane of the mitochondria. It's just half of the enzymes. And those enzymes, these yellow lines are electrons. That electrons, these guys get their electrons up, and they, like, it's like me, I get my electrons, and Brenna wants the electron more than me, and then Angelo wants it more. So each one of these wants the electron more and more and more. Like your car does the same thing, but it does it all in one step. But our body has this long process that's really all well, again, and we figure it out, which is really cool. But as these are passed along with the law of physics, it creates energy and hydrogen ions, which are actually protons, are pumped into a space. So there's this space and these hydrogens accumulate in there. So this is inside the mitochondria, this is the space. And the hydrogens are there. And the whole purpose is, if you take anatomy, you learn about ATP, the ATP moves your muscles, but it also, for your brain to communicate, for your neurons to send a message, sodium and potassium do this switch of places, floodgates open, but then you have to build up a gradient again. So you do this thing called the sodium potassium pump. You spend like weeks analyzing it, learning all about it. And that pump works by ATP. ATP is something that's going to do all the work for all your cells. But we have to make it, so we can't use it to make it. Um, and so we create a gradient. And then this gradient, it comes back in and it pushes this enzyme actually in a circle, like when you walk into the zoo and you have to go through a little turnstile or a concert, uh, and it makes ATP. So those are electrons moving along. That's kind of what that's picture showing and in doing that the hydrogen pump out and that's what that's showing um, and in doing that then the ATP the hydrogen comes in there and boom we have the ATP and it's all really elegant and this is this meeting to have a moment to be geeky these are enzymes they're huge monsters and they're like all over your mitochondria because your mitochondria is made because this is just going all the time in every cell in your body is making ATP. Uh, it's me. And I don't know what it's about. All right. Um, this is just with me showing you the picture that it is. It's like really cool. It's like a little carnival ride. And it goes around in circles. Um, I think it's pretty cool that they figured that out. This is there. Because these guys do something, which is really cool. They're still doing it right now, which is they hibernate. And during hibernation, it's like for months, they don't eat. So when you guys eat, you get warm, right? Because it's an exothermic thing that's going on with the paddle over. And so to stay warm, they actually give birth while they're hibernating. Uh, and they nurse while they're hibernating. So they actually have to fill the childbirth and all. I know, it's pretty crazy. Um, that, right, they use what is called brown fat. So we'll talk about, so the brown fat has these special channels that can get rid of the hydrogen gradient. So basically you go through every step except the last step. So they don't make ATP, so they don't get, if you have too much ATP, it turns off everything. So it's like, you don't need it anymore. And it just shuts everything down and the bear would, have to do something, but have to go get up and run around every once in a while, like you and me do every morning, uh, to use to start using the ATP. Um, but they actually have a pathway. Apparently, these pictures not there. Oh, and it showed anyway. Um, 
this was something I talked about in the very first week. All right. Uh, and it is this idea that we have brown oxide and white oxide, and white ones are stored. Uh, and the brown ones look brown because mitochondria apparently looks brown uh, when you look at under a microscope. The little white part, and that means it's going to be burning all those little white lipids stuck in there. Uh, so we want actually neither of those. So the brown oxide is what the bear was using. Is we want something called beige or the bright. They're halfway between the brown and the white. So they have mitochondria and they have fat so they can burn it. And what gets you there, so you have more of that, is um, a couple things. And the biggest thing is shivering. So when you shiver or jiggle or wiggle or giggle, that your muscle releases a protein called irisin that was only discovered like 15 years ago. Uh, by our guy at Harvard, uh, and it actually promotes these guys to do their thing. Uh, and there was, I talked about it in the first or second lecture, um, that our thermostats have increased by like 10 degrees or more, uh, and our, our girth has also increased, and that by simply turning your thermostat down a couple degrees, uh, you'll actually lose weight. And I have a student who did it, and she did. She said, um, besides some other changes, but uh, newborns apparently are mostly brown out of sight. Or, um, and, uh, irisin is actually really interesting, too, because I assume to the paper, and I have you always find the dark side of it. And there is this one guy, he must have got kicked out of the lab. He must have, like, the guy who runs it. And his website is dedicated to just, like, saying everything's wrong. Uh, everything about irisin was wrong. But irisin's, like, the super thing that is actually produced by your muscles when you're using your muscles. And it doesn't have to be extreme exercise. It can just be sugar. So when the room is cold, like next term, well, next term is going to be spring term, but remember last term, that room is thankfully cool, um, that you're shivering, that's a good thing. Or just going for gentle exercise and stuff, you're producing this. This is like a big anti, it's like anti, um, it protects your brain from sort of Alzheimer's, it helps with inflammation, it, it just like is this miracle protein. Um, so we're back to this slide that we've seen a lot. And this slide should suddenly have some things to start kicking out that free radicals, our biggest source of free radicals, because we know about smoking. We're not supposed to smoke, vaping, smoking anything does it. Ultraviolet light from the sun, air pollution, right? If we get exposed to something, what's missing is all the food that was talked about that creates it. But what is on every slide is this guy, and that is mitochondria. That your biggest source of free radicals in your body is your mitochondria. And that's why people who over exercise don't ever have long lives because they're making too many free radicals. So, our body, why is it making free radicals? Uh, why is our mitochondria? It's actually kind of cool. Um, the last step is basically the oxygen and the electrons are going to make water. And there's also these hydrogen ions. This is not balanced. It's called this. The oxygen is not happening. The oxygen is an oxidation state. Those of you who have taken chemistry with me, where it has a halo, we get a thing. And, and it's not happy. And so, what drives our life? is O2, what we breathe in, because it wants its own electrons. It doesn't want to share with its partner, the other O. And so water is a perfect molecule, because the water is just at an oxidation state of negative two, more chemistry than, than you need there, but it's perfect. The thing is, is in that last step, the whole point of this whole thing was to get the electrons to the oxygen that you breathe in. Is the oxygen's a little bit too, exuberant, like way too exuberant, and you end up with free radicals. And so these are called rough. Um, and so cross is the reactive oxygen species. The teacher often says radical oxygen species, because I think of it as free radicals. But saying that the oxygen was too reactive, and so instead of water, which is like the permanent molecule, right? <laughs> Uh, it combines and we get H2O2, which 
is hydrogen peroxide. And so people with dentistry, a lot of people brush their teeth with hydrogen peroxide or gargle with it because it kills bacteria. Because the oxygen there is actually in a negative one instead of a negative two. So it got halfway. And so it's actually even more reactive because it got partway there, but it didn't get all the way there. It's like you're halfway to Christmas, it's Christmas Eve, and you get even more and more excited. Uh, it can make or combine with only one hydrogen. And it makes what's called a hydroxyl radical. And you don't have to know all this detail, but it's kind of cool because you don't have the chemistry in here. Or this one where it's called superoxide. And so it's basically that last step. All of this was all about this electron in your food. Uh, and a free radical is something that doesn't have the right number of electrons. And it's going to get the electrons from wherever it can, which is the cells in your body. Uh, from your DNA, and so it's going to cause DNA damage. But more than DNA, your cell is surrounded by cell membranes. And so it's going to steal electrons from all those fatty acids. Uh, your cell membranes are also your arteries, so you're going to get damage to your arteries, which is going to cause heart disease and stuff. You're going to get damage to DNA to the cell, which can cause cancer, um, cause inflammation and stuff. So the free radicals that we, we learn throughout our life, we learn throughout the terms that our food, right? High sugar food, high um, heat of food will create free radicals. But one of the big sources is just day to day breathing. We have to breathe because none of us, we're in here, we haven't mastered the whole yoga thing or we don't have to breathe at this state. So as you learn to breathe slower, you're gonna make less of this. So we do need to be active, but it's finding that right amount of activity where you can stay in a place of joy uh, and continue to breathe. Or you can be the people who want the biggest muscles possible. So these are all the different sources of free radicals. Exogenous means from the outside. So we can see, right, pollution. We can see the sunlight. Oh, that was your soda. This one is great. You can pick the cigarettes or the soda. How is going to go? Maybe they leave the sun up there. Uh, viruses, there's certain viruses. COVID was really good at that. Uh, no more we can go. We can have stress, or we can have stress from eating a low carb diet. That is a highly processed food that's known to cause um, cancer. Uh, we're, I'm going to assume I'm going this way now with this. Uh, x rays, but x rays have been made now that they're much better. Uh, that you don't get this coming out of the high energy waves. Uh, right. If you're going to have cake, make it a good cake and then move on. Uh, eating fried food. So this was, maybe it's coming up. Uh, eating fast food of any kind. So learn to make your own burgers. So I know a couple people did. Um, and I think I put it in there that it's really easy to make your own bean burger. It's so easy to do with mushrooms. Well, G bombs thing you can get in your own burger. Those kind of processed plant based burgers are possibly worse than everything. Uh, and then stress is a huge one. And the whole thing is there because uh, in the sunlight, um, but we talked about vitamin D a little bit. We'll talk about it again next week. Uh, the biggest source of the background of free radicals is every day our breathing of the air. And there we go. I call them radical oxygen species, but it is correctly reactive oxygen species. Um, I love this picture of mitochondria. I don't know why. And I did actually have this slide in there. Uh, that's a, that's actually what they are. And it has to do with those of you who have chemistry. And we do biochemistry. I look at them more. Uh, that the oxygen combined incorrectly with the electrons. So instead of making water, you're all familiar with water. I don't think that's a huge step in my chemistry. Forward. That you can see if the water molecule that this didn't get formed quite right. It's like a little bit off. And so because of that, it all comes down to the electrons. Um, and right, these are pictures that just show that where you're getting cancer from is from the free radicals that are formed. That is the picture, somebody's picture of a mitochondria that causes DNA damage um, or causes autophagy where you get right um, 
like all different things. And what they're going to cause is aging. So the cause of the aging is this production of these. We must have a way to defend them naturally. Uh, and so this is wonderful myth that we keep producing uh, and also from breathing. And so learning how to breathe slower, there's actually a lot of stuff out there now about the importance of breathing through your nose instead of the gulping through our mouth. Of taking full breaths, which will make you breathe slower, but breathing through your nose makes you have to breathe slower because you're getting less oxygen in. Um, you know, uh, and cancer. So you can pick whatever color, uh, which is that you don't want to ever have to deal with any of these. Uh, so cell membrane gets damaged, and so again, if we start having holes in this wall, that's not going to be good. The cell is not going to survive. Sorry. Apparently, uh, you can see like, which organ you want to affect. Uh, so it could be most of you have probably seen in the heart. This is just coated with cholesterol and fat. You've never seen one of these pictures. But this one is actually one favorite of mine. That is your liver. So your liver is over here, and that is what a lot of people's livers look like. The thing that is really fascinating is you can't heal. They've definitely proven it with heart, and it actually doesn't you have to change all bits of your lifestyle. Um, cataracts, so you, uh, you can't see out of your eyes. People who smoke age so prematurely. She's probably younger than me. Um, yeah, a common cold. So people are always getting sick. Uh, and sometimes as you make the changes, and many of you may have seen this throughout the term, that you may have gone through sickness or something because your body is detoxing and getting rid of stuff. And so don't view it as, oh no, it's like, this is good. My body is getting a chance to express. In Chinese medicine, it was actually something that blew me away. And I was so excited, like the first week of school, because the herbs they give you is not to suppress your cough or to suppress all the stuff coming out of you. They're trying to get you to express it. And you know, you know like when you get sick and you get really sick for a day, the next day you're good. It's like your body got rid of everything and you go to bed and you're sick. Instead of when you're a little bit sick and you just keep doing everything and it just goes on and on and on. Uh, inflammations, this is all what free radicals do. And we've talked about them. And, and this, this is becoming a buzzword. It shows up a lot. Um, and people use it as if they know what it means. But if you think back two months ago when I first talked about free radicals, it's somebody always is like, what are you talking about? Uh, but free radicals are going to cause us to be in a disease state. So what can we do? Because the body is going to just make these no matter what. Your body does have natural defenses to clean up the damage. Um, and it is to make the healthy choices. Uh, and it is that we can increase the antioxidants. There are natural antioxidants that our body is geared for. Uh, is one, not to take in things that are going to make more free radicals. And so, you know, if you're, there, there is no healthy bacon. There is no healthy processed meat. If you want to pretend like there is and say, well, I switched turkey bacon, uh, you're lying to yourself. Um, and same with the fake meats, meaning the vegan ones, because veganism is like a really unhealthy trend. Uh, the idea is that you're eating real food. Um, and so whatever that food is, so your fruits and vegetables, okay, you're getting a plethora of them. Uh, this is, I don't know if this question made it this time, but we've seen this before, but this is also my plug for what comes next week at this time. So or act we've seen before, and this is our ability to absorb um, the free radicals that are formed. And so there it's showing a free radical where the electrons are not paired correctly and eating, right? Eating the rainbow, that's what that whole rainbow leaf was about. Um, and that's what I wanted on there. That what is beyond all the rainbow on the ORAC value are your spices. And you guys are going to be doing a talk, one more. So the final exam, you do one more talk, one more paper, and you get to pick a spice. Now, interestingly, chocolate shows up on here three times, maybe four, um, but it's kind of spice. Necessarily. Um, if you want, you can look through my book real quick to flip through. If you don't know or you come up to tell me, you're like, 
spice that you'd like to do. If you're going to email me, I suggest picking several, but I'll tell you the big ones are already taken, uh, like turmeric, um, paprika, cayenne. Um, you know, nobody's picked black pepper. Black pepper is a super spice. It might be the super of the super spices in your cabinet. Um, and so everybody talks about salt, but it is the pepper. Load up on the pepper. Um, somebody did pepper last term and she was like, oh my gosh, this was amazing. There are tons of papers on it. Um, I'm trying to be parsley. Nobody's picked parsley yet. Uh, basil. Nobody's picked basil, um, which somebody did basil last term. And in the basil category is holy basil, which is actually one of the adaptogens. Uh, cloves. It's at the very top here. Nobody's ever been closed. There's actually some really cool research on all these things. Cinnamon's gone. Um, anyway, I'm just throwing them out for, yeah, more chocolate. Um, and also in here, there's other ones. Cardamom, nobody ever picks cardamom either. Most of you probably don't even know what cardamom is. Do you know cardamom? Do you guys have cardamom? That's a, in, in your, if you drink chai, um, chai should have cardamom. And also, true chai has black pepper in it. Um, so they have the peppercorn. It's actually, it's cooked with the peppercorn, uh, which sounds weird, but it actually does. It, black pepper amplifies every other spice. So whatever you're cooking, just add black pepper as well as all your other spices. Very cool uh, spice. So um, anyway, that was my big plug. So that, the other question with that, that a couple of people are asking, uh, so next week, Monday, I'm going to finally do my vitamin talk. Monday's a regular day. Next week is the 10th week. On Wednesday, we are doing presentations. So uh, you can tell me today if you want to present Wednesday. Half of you are going to present next week on Wednesday. The other half of you, finals week then, is two weeks from now. And so the 11th week or finals week, we're not doing a final. That will be the rest of our presentation will be on that Monday. So you do have a choice between Wednesday or Monday. Um, and it's like regular class time and stuff. And your papers will do all the stuff to do that Monday. The other thing that's coming up, um, yeah, so get your topic in, especially, so those of you who are like been on the ball and you're like, you wanna get it all done before finals week. So because you know what's coming in your other classes, you can't in your presentation next week, get it done and not have to worry about my class. Um, in comfort presentations because that is some point of your grade and uh, but this was actually really cool this is actually pretty hot out there <laughs> exercise radicals so Ross is free radicals and cancer and there's actually several books out there now um, and it used to be when people got cancer they would tell them to just rest rest and it's more you do, you get extremely tired. Cancer is like sucking all the energy from your body. It goes, cancer goes into a type, it doesn't actually go through these two steps. It goes through, um, goes through a special type of metabolism, but it basically starts sucking all the oxygen from your body. And so you're very fatigued. And then of course people going through therapy treatment for it are gonna feel extra fatigued. But this was interesting because when I first read the article several years ago, I was thinking, you know, free radicals are going to cause a cancer. And this made me rethink it. And so that's why they tell people to just rest. Uh, one of the biggest things you have to completely change is that if you want to change your diet so you don't get cancer, definitely if you got cancer, you have to change your diet, which is no sugar, no process, and actually also no animal products. Um, so why not do it now so you don't have to go through it? Uh, you guys ever hear of Watson and Crick, the guys who figured out DNA? And this is actually highlighted and underlined, it's like copied it straight from Wikipedia, which um, was why I left it like that. Um, but they proposed that the lack of these free radicals actually promote cancer. And so they're saying that the production by mitochondria, this is within the cell, so different from all those exogenous forces. Um, that these guys actually might be being produced in a protective way. Now, I'm not saying overproduction of them. So people who are over-exercising, I'm talking 
Um, you all probably know somebody who spends like eight hours at the gym and they're all about everything's about the gym or or they're doing like ultra marathons, like the 125 mile marathon. And that's all their life is about. Uh, but they think it has to do that these guys kill the cancer cells. And since cancer cells are growing so much faster, they actually will target the cancer cells. So it's a natural, we all have cancer cells in us right now. Um, it's just our body recognizes them and gets rid of them. And so uh, the idea, and this, this theory, this is from 2014. Um, it's actually expanded quite a bit and they've shown lots of studies with this, that these free radicals actually help your proteins fold correctly within the cells. And so the thing that's interesting about these free radicals from all the ones from the environment from the outside, they're made in the cells and so they're already in there. Whereas the other ones are on the outside so they're attacking the membrane, they're going to be attacking your blood vessels, attacking your organs and stuff. Uh, and so they actually see that um, when you exercise, you can create more free radicals. Uh, and they have found when people get cancer now, they actually do tell them you need to go for a walk every day. That's like I've had several friends they've had cancer. Like I have to go for my walk now. My doctor said it's really important. Or they actually will have these classes, um, which actually these are also important. That there's always the four pillars. So besides the exercise, and it's not saying they have to go running. You're not going to have the energy to run if you have cancer. Um, but that you're getting some exercise. Exercise also promotes irisin. So if we want to look at a molecular level, but they're also exercising outside, so you're going to feel happy because you're out in the sunlight, um, but it's a healthy diet, it's a healthy level of exercise, um, and so it's those four pillars that you guys are working on with blue zones, um, we're just talking about, because a lot of it should already be in there. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, because it's what's coming up next week, and is this, it is our 10th week. And it's something you did in the first week. And I said, you'll be doing it again in the 10th week. So this week you're doing the blue zones. And I didn't make any recommendations other than to eat real food and eat healthy. And so next week you are going to be doing your three-day diet analysis. There is going to be a challenge in there, but it'll be like half a week challenge like the previous one. So there is still one more of those. Um, yeah. I don't remember what else I was going to say. Um, and so we always have that choice. And so a healthy amount of exercise, as well as you want to eat the highly processed food. There are healthy ways to eat bread. Um, and, and here we actually have good choices. Uh, and there are healthy things to put on your bread. Um, but also, you know, when you go to a potluck, when you go to somebody's house, be the one. My son went to uh, an event last night with somebody's birthday, and they were all signing up to bring stuff. And he was reading me the list that was completely junk food, and at the bottom was strawberries, blueberries, or bananas. So he signed up for bananas because I was like, what kind of gear? I don't know where we'll get blueberries and strawberries. Well, somebody showed up at my house with a crate of blueberries. So I'm like, well, I can bring blueberries too. Take some of the blueberries. We ended up having those because nobody signed up for any of the fruit. So he brought like a huge tray of fruit, which he ate half of it. I mean, part of the reason we always bring something like that is so I have something. Um, but be the person that brings that. But other people did eat the stuff. Um, and so the hope is, and also the importance of sleep. And so for all of you, because you're building up towards finals, we want to all end strong, not just in this class, but in all classes. So don't burn the midnight oil. I got an email I got last night at two in the morning from all my classes. It's just fascinating to me taking the time to be playful so today the sun's going to be out i think the snow that fake snow i'm telling you it was if you had put it in your hand it was not like a snow i've ever seen right in your exercise dare to be playful in exercise uh and find that time for laughter right so uh if you have an idea for a topic um, well let me stop